Good morning. Please, please take your seat. Uh, my name is Jeff Dunn. I'm the former chairman of the San Jacinto Historical Advisory Board. And I will give a, want to give a brief introduction. We still have people coming in and registering, so it will take a while for everybody to get settled in. Uh, but I wanted to at least uh, welcome every, everybody here to the 17th Annual Battle of San Jacinto Symposium. It was 181 years ago that this month, uh, nearly six months, uh, six weeks after the fall of the Alamo, that a group of about 900 men under, which called themselves the Texas Army, under General Sam Houston was at this site, arriving here on the morning of April 20th, 1836. And uh, later that morning, they encountered a division of the Mexican Army under General Santa Ana. And uh, after a few brief Firing back and forth, uh, the very next day, the Texans attacked that Mexican division and defeated them in what came to be known as the Battle of San Jacinto. Uh, and since then, that battle has become recognized as a pivotal moment in Texas history. <clears throat> it ended the military phase of the Texas Revolution, uh, helped establish the independent Republic of Texas and eventually annexation of Texas to the United States. And it has been a tradition of Texans since then to commemorate the battle each anniversary, each April 21st. Um, and uh, San Jacinto Day was actually uh, memorialized in the 1870s as the first official Texas holiday along with Texas Independence Day. And the battlefield itself was preserved in the early 1900s uh, as the first uh, historical park in Texas. And of course, this followed in the 1930s with the construction of the San Jacinto Monument, <clears throat> the tallest masonry monument in the world, uh, which apparently was intentionally higher than the Washington Monument so that they could claim that uh, we could claim that we had the highest one uh, of anybody. In uh, the year 2000, I was appointed to the Historical Advisory Board in 1996 and became chairman in 2000. And at that time, uh, Jan DeVault and Nina Hendy and I, who were the public members of this board, decided that it would be interesting and useful to have an academic dimension to the annual commemoration of St. Jacinta Day. And from that effort, the, this symposium uh, was born. And over these years, we've had, <clears throat> we've had over 80 speakers uh, from all across the country including five speakers from Mexico and even one from Scotland. Uh, we've had uh, 31 different uh, colleges and universities represented by our scholarly speakers and produced a great body of work, all of which has been recorded. Uh, many of these pr presentations are actually on YouTube. Uh, and thanks to Houston Media Source, uh, these uh, programs continue to be recorded as they are today. Uh, and, but today's symposium is actually historic in itself for two reasons. First, of all the 17 symposiums we've had, this is the first one actually at the battleground. Uh, we've always had logistical problems trying to have it here, but this year we decided we we're going to have it here, which gives us an opportunity for a battleground tour this afternoon. And the second reason this is historic is because we're going through a transition in the management. Uh, initially, the, uh, as I mentioned, the symposium was uh, under, under the auspices of the San Jacinto Historical Advisory Board. A few years after that, it transitioned and became uh, under the management of the nonprofit San Jacinto Battlefield uh, Conservancy, which is where we're, we're operating it today. Uh, but as of the end of today, we're going to transition to the Texas State Historical Association. So this program will henceforth be a program of TSHA. <clears throat> I would like to uh, thank a number of people for the event today. First of all, your program list uh, <clears throat> members of the San Jacinto Committee. These are volunteers that help manage and put this on. Uh, it, this year's chairman were, are uh, Barbara Eves and uh, Dave Singleton. Uh, also, the uh, donors and sponsors are listed in the program. The Battleground uh, Conservancy Board of Directors and Advisors, uh, we, the major sponsors, TSHA, Humanities Texas, and the Center for the Study 
of the Southwest at Texas State University. And also uh, want to uh, acknowledge the uh, help of Texas Parks and Wildlife Department today. Um, <clears throat> in addition, uh, we have exhibitors. Uh, we have booksellers, we have reenactors here today, uh, various organizations. Um, I want to mention that uh, if you've not already done so, you can take your lunch order. You have to give your, the lady up front your, your lunch order if you haven't already done that. Uh, restrooms are over here on my left. Um, and uh, we're looking forward to having a great day. We have some great speakers. And I'd like to start by introducing our moderator, Jim Crisp. Uh, Jim is a native Texan. He is a graduate of Rice, Yale, and has spent his career as professor of history at North Carolina State, focusing on Texas history. He's a fellow of TSHA, a member of the Institute of Texas Letters and Texas Philosophical Society, and has uh, been our academic uh, uh, moderator uh, almost from the very beginning, with one exception. Uh, and when he was a speaker. So with that, I'd like to welcome you again to our symposium and now Jim Crisp. Thank you very much. Actually, there are two exceptions. Uh, I was a speaker at the first San Jacinto Symposium and a mere heckler in the audience uh, at the second San Jacinto Symposium. And uh, to get rid of me uh, in that position, they made me moderator for life so that I can't be a heckler anymore. Uh, I want to take two quick points, <clears throat> pardon me, <clears throat> two quick points of personal privilege. One is to introduce my editor, Charles Swanland, who's down here. Charles, if you'll put your hand up. This is the latest, one of the very latest publications on the Texas Revolution and Republic. It is Single Star of the West, the Republic of Texas, 1836-1845. Uh, how many historians collaborated, Charles? 16 articles by 16 historians, including yours truly. And Charles has a bunch of copies here today. Although he doesn't have a table, he'll sell you a book. My second point of personal privilege is to mention another professor from far off North Carolina State University, and that's Charles Frazier. That may not be a name familiar to you. He is a former colleague. Uh, in the English department, who wrote a book called Cold Mountain, uh, and which is, I think, one of the best books I've read in the last 30 years. They made a movie of it with Nicole Kidman and Jude Law. There's a scene in that movie where uh, a group of men are executed by Confederate partisans. Uh, that scene is not quite historical, it's dramatic, but it was inspired by a book called Victims, A True Story of the Civil War by Philip Shaw Paladin. And I'm going to talk about San Jacinto today, very briefly, by borrowing a metaphor that Philip Shaw Paladin used in his little book, Victims. It's the metaphor of the hourglass. He starts with the Smoky Mountains and the Western North Carolina mountains generally, and explains what they're like. And then he gets down to the coming of the Civil War and why the mountains were so, the mountaineers were so divided in their loyalties. And he talks about partisan warfare and guerrilla warfare because that's what was going on in the North Carolina mountains. And then he gets down to the day when 13 Unionist partisans were captured and then taken out and shot in the back of the head and executed by the Confederate Army. This was illegal under both Confederate and Union law. And then he follows that out to look at all of the consequences that flowed from that atrocity. In other words, the pivotal moment in his book and one of the pivotal moments in Texas history is that point in the hourglass when only one grain of sand can come through. And to a certain extent, San Jacinto is that middle of the hourglass. Think about all that we have to know about the Spanish settlement of New Spain, Mexico, the English colonies on the Atlantic coast, the gradual coming together of these two societies, 
the development of a Texan character that spoke both Spanish and English, and then the war itself coming down to this almost miraculous victory by Sam Houston here on this battlefield, and then everything that has flowed from there on. That's what a pivotal moment is like. And we are very privileged to have with us people who will talk about that moment, both the coming of that moment and the consequences of that moment. Um, I'm going to dispense with it, most of my individual introductions so that we can be uh, on time with our live streaming that's going on. I want to say hello to my granddaughter Lainey in North Carolina, just in case she's watching the live streaming. Uh, hopefully she's hopping up and down right now. Um, uh, our, our speakers uh, for the first half of our morning will be Dr. Greg Dimmick and Dr. Steve Harden. We've had an argument at our table already about which doctor is most useful, the pediatrician or the academic. I don't think there's much of a contest there, uh, especially for my granddaughter. But um, Greg Demick uh, is someone that I actually met for the first time in the Alamo Chapel when he handed me a canister ball that had been dropped in Wharton County by the Mexican Army on its retreat after San Jacinto. Um, and there's a long story about Greg's relationship to the Mexican Army and their detritus, if that's the right word, all the things they left behind. Uh, he's found more of their stuff than anyone else in the world and given most of it to Texas A&M. Uh, but uh, Greg uh, used his avocation as a metal detector to launch him on a career as a really fine historian. Uh, one of my other memories of Greg Demick is bouncing along in his pickup on the back roads of Wharton County as he's listening to Spanish tapes, trying to learn the language so that he can be a better historian. Uh, and um, I've, I've, uh, I've watched uh, with great uh, joy and admiration as, as Greg has gone from archaeological treatises to really, really good books and some of the best scholarship on the Mexican army and the Mexican officers of that army. Uh, 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 th that exist. Um, the other doctor, Dr. Steve Harden, is someone I've known uh, even longer, I believe. And uh, Steve, uh, as I said last night in our reception, has taken his cues as a writer from Homer and Edgar Allan Poe. Uh, the two books that are mentioned in your program are his Texian Iliad. Uh, the Military History of the Texas Revolution, which is an absolute classic and one of the basic books of Texas, and Texian Macabre. That's the one uh, that perhaps Poe had the influence on. Um, if you've never looked at that book or read that book, and if you're from the city of Houston or the surrounding area, you need to read it because the protagonist of that book, the focus of that book, is the raw, rowdy city of Houston in 1838. Uh, and there are some things in that book which will uh, surprise you. I, I'll, I'll leave it at that. But uh, it is a macabre story of death and not exactly resurrection, but digging up the bodies. Um, our speakers in the second half of our morning are Laura McLemore. Uh, who, like me, is fascinated by historiography. I was even fascinated by historiography before I knew there was such a word. And a lot of spell checkers don't even know that it exists. Uh, but historiography is the study of how people have written history. And Laura's first book, Inventing Texas, on the early historians of Texas, the 19th century historians of Texas, uh, is a book that everyone interested ought to read because many of the things we thought we knew about Texas as we grew up in the late 20th and 21st centuries are actually myths that work their way into our histories. And uh, 
One of the great joys of the Texas State Historical Association, again, as I mentioned last night, is the fine mix of academics and non-academics that we have in the Texas State Historical Association. Uh, I've been a member of many historical associations in my life, and none, of, none are more fun or more rewarding than being a part of the Texas State Historical Association. It's about half academics and half non-academics, a little bit like our morning program and our uh, the both halves of our morning program. Um, the general public helps keep the academics honest and well-grounded. When you're having to deal with a public audience, you can't get too lofty or esoteric in your ideas and formulations. As Steve Harden told me one time, he wrote his book, Taxi and Iliad, not for the professor down the hall, but for the guy down the street. And we need to stay grounded in that way. But by the same token, and this is one of the reasons for this San Jacinto Symposium, the general public, especially those of us who, le who learned our Texas history from our mom or dad or TV or comic books or movies, uh, we need to stay, we academics need to keep you guys grounded too and occasionally talk about the actual evidence of what happened in the past, uh, the actual evidence of that history. Um, and so uh, the final speaker this morning, uh, J.P. Bryan, uh, brings his background, which is essentially that of an entrepreneur, a non-academic, and I, I tend to think of him as the patriarch of the Austin family, although the Austin, oh, Stephen Austin had no children, his sister, Emily Austin uh, married Mr. Bryan and Mr. Perry and the Bryans and Perrys, some of whom may be here today in addition to JP, uh, have carried forward their love of Texas and their love of the history of Texas. And um, JP Bryan will be talking to us at the end of our session today about the legacy of San Jacinto. So think about that hourglass. Think about all that came before that day on April 21st, 1836, and all that has flowed from what happened here on that day. Because if things had happened a little differently that day, uh, we wouldn't be here today. And now, without further ado, and spending any more uh, time, I would like to introduce doctor, a real doctor, Greg Demick. Thank you all for having me here today. I usually try to do a little banter and uh, cut myself down a little bit about being a pediatrician, not a historian, but I found so much stuff on the Mexican Army, I got to get right to it. So, so I'm going to tell you, first of all, if six months ago, before I started preparing this talk, if you had asked me to give you a brief description of what the Mexican Army was about at San Jacinto, I probably would have told you something along the lines of, Oh, the afternoon of the 21st, the Texans attacked them. They surprised them completely. And the really bad news for the Mexican Army was that Coase, General Coase, had come into the camp that morning with about 500 reinforcements, actually 400, because 100 of them were left at, at Harrisburg with the wagons. Uh, they, the Sidney Sherman troops on the, Me on the Texans left and hit the Mexican right, and that was where Coase was camped. And so his troops, his reinforcements, who had been uh, on an 18-hour march, uh, were exhausted. They were asleep. And because Sidney Sherman attacked first on the Mexican right, those soldiers rushed right through the Mexican camp and caused total chaos. And so the Mexicans were never able to organize any kind of, a, of, of an organized uh, defense. And they started running. And it, from then on, it was just a matter of tracing down and killing as many as they could. That, that would have been my brief discussion. Well, now, after six months of looking into this, because I knew I had to give this talk, I found out I was pretty much wrong on most of that, OK? <laughs> Uh, so if I've told you that story before, just kind of see if you could get that out of your heads right now. Just forget it. That's not what happened. And there's so much information. I am going to start with basically three eyewitnesses. 
I'm going to talk with, uh, I'm going to listen to what Santa Ana said. I'm going to tell you what Santa Ana said. I'm going to tell you what Pedro Delgado said. He was a lieutenant colonel. He was on uh, Santa Ana's staff, his headquarters staff. He had an account later. And I'm going to give you a little bit of information from Ramon Caro. He was the, the private secretary of Santa Ana, so he was there and involved. And then I've got five surprise witnesses for you. And I don't, I would be very surprised if more than one or two people in this room has ever heard from any one of these five. And I have one of them that I think none of you have heard from, okay? So I've got a few new witnesses here. I will tell you that I have no Texans witnesses and I didn't look into any Texans witnesses. I didn't want to know what they said because I want to not be biased and I don't want to compare the two. I don't want to tell you whether this one is, well, the Texans said this and the Mexicans said that. This is the Mexican perspective, okay? They're my people, okay? So let's get started. I will tell you that even though I would tell you that story, that short story, there is a part of me that didn't, that had, had some doubts about some of it, okay? Two things that have lingered in my mind and I never really chased them down thoroughly. A little bit, yes, but not thoroughly. Y'all will recognize this good looking gentleman here as one of our speakers today. In year two or year three, I was on a medical mission and I couldn't come, but the word got to me that Dr. Harden talked about a counterattack. And I had never heard anything about a counterattack, that the Mexicans counterattacked. So it was like I had to look that up. And I, it, it, somebody told me it was in Santa Ana's Manifiesto. As it turns out, it wasn't. It's published with it by Castaneda in the Mexican side of the Texas Revolution. But for some reason, he took two documents, put them together, and acted like it was one. OK? And I'm going to get into that a little bit more. The other thing that had me curious was archeological. Because of my sea of mud work that Texas Parks and Wildlife was kind enough to invite uh, uh, myself and several other volunteer metal detectorists to help the professional archeologists uh, do uh, a traditional, uh, 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 to me, it was, it was traditional, but it was still edge of the envelope battlefield archeology span here. And we had found two uh, uh, chest plates from the Battalion Guerrero. And, and it wasn't just the fact that we found these chest plates, it was where we found them. And you can see these two red stars here. One of these, the, the, the red star to the right is almost exactly where the marker says the Mexican cannon was located during the battle, okay? And the other one to the left, the red star to the left, is basically where Sam Houston was supposedly wounded. If you see that, that road that has a loop, a cul-de-sac there, that, that marker is right there that said Sam Houston was wounded there. Well, if Sam Houston was wounded there, it should be in front of the breastworks. And what's a Guerrero breastplate doing out in front of the breastworks? That always bothered me. To be honest with you, my answer was that the breastworks weren't where the markers say they were. I assumed the breastworks were further towards the monument and the, the Guerrero Battalion plate was behind the breastworks, like it should be. Well, I've rethought that now. So let's start and go back and let's talk about what troops were there. This is something that I think nobody has ever really documented well. There are several witnesses, but I've never seen anybody actually put it together. And I'm really comfortable with the, the units here that I'm going to tell you. I think we have so many different uh, sources that back this up that I think these units were the units that were there. Now the numbers of the troops that I came up with are obviously cloudy. I started with the troops that came into Texas. We have their unit strengths. I should, you should note that on their unit strength reports, they only talk about enlisted men. So the numbers are not the total number of troops. These are the number of enlisted men. Well, then I realized when I first started looking at this, I had to go back and take out the ones that were at the Alamo. Several of these units fought at the Alamo, and we do have Andrade's list of dead and wounded from each unit. So I took out the dead, and then I took out a little bit for wounded and desertions. I didn't know how badly they were wounded, and I didn't know how many deserted. I used De La Pena's number. He gave an estimate, so I used a percentage. But I tried to use those numbers and come up with a reasonable number of troops. So we have, there was only, Santa Ana, when he crossed the Brazos on April 14th, 
He only had one uh, battalion complete, and that was the Matamoros Battalion, and they had been at the Alamo. I gave them about 306. Then the next four lines, you'll see it says preferential. So these are preferential companies. Each infantry battalion had six, had, I'm sorry, eight companies. Six of them were regular infantry. One was called the Caceres, the light infantry, and the other was called the Grenadiers. Those were the veteran troops. The Grenadiers and the, and the Caceres were the preferential companies. They were the better companies. So Santa Ana took the best companies from four, different, four other battalions, okay? So if you throw in the Matamoros, he had 10 preferential companies and only six units of regular infantry. He had a six-pounder artillery piece. Uh, he had uh, about 60 cavalrymen, and about half of those were his own private personal escort. So he didn't have much cavalry at all. Coase left the Brazos, crossed the Brazos on April 19th. I would have told you six months ago that he had 500 troops and that 100 of them were left with the baggage wagon, so he brought 400 troops in. But when you look at the, the troops that were sent, these were the regular infantry companies, so the six uh, regular infantry companies from the battalions that Santa Ana took their preferential troops. And if you look at the numbers, it's pretty impressive. It's like the, he had two preferential companies of the Guadalajara. The rest of them did not come to San Jacinto, but he brought basically the rest of those three battalions. So we're looking at like 800 guys here, okay? Um, that seemed high to me. So I went back and looked at another document that I don't know why I put it in my book, Sea of Mud, but I put it in there. And this was a document, and it's the troops that were in Victoria on May 14th. So this is a retreating Mexican army. And I remembered there that there were some troops that shouldn't be there, okay? The Aldama, Guerrero, and Toluca, those are those three that Coast took the regulars. There's quite a few troops there. I assume that most of these guys from the Aldama, Guerrero, and Toluca were with the wagon train because they never made it to San Jacinto and they did make it back to the Mexican army, okay? So those are explainable. The Guadalajara, I only put that number in there because it makes my number look fairly good. If you look at the number of troops that came into Texas and subtract the ones that were in Victoria there, it leaves about 120 and I put 100 as their preferential company. So those numbers aren't too bad. But the Matamoros, what the heck are Matamoros troops doing in Victoria when Santa Ana took the whole battalion with him? This makes me think, and I've always been convinced, the Mexican Army was kind of fluid on loaning soldiers from one outfit to the other outfit. You would lots of times see somebody witness, they would say, I'm in this battalion, but I'm attached to this battalion. So there was interchange, and of course we have the wounded from the Alamo, and we also have sick people. But other than that, that's all I can tell you. But we had 48 guys who were documented to be in Victoria from the Matamoros Battalion. So when I came up with a total, I had to take those guys out. So I, I took 661 with Santa Ana, 800 with Coase, took out the 238, I got 1,223. And to be honest with you, I'm really happy with that number. If you look at the, uh, some of the accounts of the other witnesses, including Houston and some of them, uh, I think those numbers are pretty good, about 1,250. To be honest with you, before I even went through all this, I had always had 1,248. So when I redid it, I came up with almost the exact same number, but obviously a lot more troops with coasts, and, but they'd all still came out about the same. Now I want to show you another really interesting document. This document uh, uh, is a list that was made by a, a sergeant in the Mexican Army. He was a prisoner at Galveston. And this is, uh, his name was Santiago Rabia, and he was in the Tampico, and he made a list of all the, the enlisted men that were at Galveston as prisoners of war from San Jacinto. And this is a really valuable document. I didn't even realize it when I found it at the time. I was very interested in their names because I keep a list of all the names of the Mexican soldiers and it's very hard to find any enlisted men. So here was several hundred enlisted men that I had their names. He gives their rank, their unit, their hometown, and he gives their trade. Some of them were barbers, some of them repaired shoes. He gives that in there. You can tell it's a bit hard to read. I got most of the names out of there. Uh, but it struck me when I was preparing the talk 
that this was a real opportunity to have a good idea about how many troops were captured from each unit versus were killed from each unit. And I think you can use those numbers to have a good idea to see which units were more involved in the fighting and suffered greater casualties. You'll see here that uh, Matamoros, which makes perfect sense, and the Guadalajara had only had 14 percent captured of the troops that were there. So we're looking at probably 86 percent were killed. You know, I know these are not firm numbers, but it gives you a good idea. The Guerrero, which is going to be very important, was kind of in the middle there at 32 percent. The Aldama, which some people want to put up on the front lines of the of the uh, of the uh, uh, battle, had only 54 54 percent were captured. So for only 46 percent killed. So they were by far the least uh, 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 affected or ca uh, casualties, the uh, lightest number of casualties. So these, I'm going to come back to this slide later, and I think it'll make more sense to you in a little while. So where were these troops deployed? This is the Yoakum map, and he's got the Mexican army there, there, but he doesn't give any detail. And I really have never seen any maps that tell exactly where the things were. I looked on the map and tried to find where the Mexican cannon was, and I, there's a blotch one place that could be the cannon, but I wasn't sure exactly. I wasn't convinced that, that, he, that it was on there where the Mexican cannon was. I think this is one of the better maps, and I think it's got, I, I, I think it's got a, a probably about right where things were, but he gave no detail on the Mexican army. So I went back and looked at the document that, that Santa Ana uh, 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 wrote that once again is published with his representation or his manifesto, but it's not. It's not the same document. This is a, a document that he wrote when he got back to Mexico. He wrote it at March 11th, 1837. He wrote it to Tornell. His not, this was his report of what happened, and it's a long document. And Castaneda translated it and put it right with his other, and, and he doesn't make much notice that it's two separate documents. And I found it to be much more trustworthy because he wasn't trying to convince the Mexican government of anything like he was in his manifesto. So I thought this was pretty good. There's a lot of glowing errors, and a lot of it is just CYA. He was trying to, con to if you read Santa Ana, everything was everybody else's fault, and he was to blame for nothing, okay? And that's just, you go in there, you'll be impressed. He does not take any blame. There's nothing he could have done different. But, as far as the placement of the Mexican army, he said there were three preferential companies guarding the woods in the right. That really struck me like a load of bricks. It wasn't Costa's troops. He assigned three of those ten preferential companies to guard the right. Okay? He said, he, he said the Matamoros battalion was in battle. He said they were in battle position and they, they were formed in the center does not mention the Aldama. Remember, the Aldama regulars didn't come in to tell Coase. So the Aldama is not on the front line. The Matamoros is. And another interesting thing, he said the cannon was placed to the left of the center. So they're on the left. I've always pictured the cannon in the center of the Mexican lines. But no, they're on the left, OK? So the archaeology we did around where the cannon was, we're on the far left of the Mexican line. We're not in the center of the Mexican line like I always thought we were, OK? And it makes sense when you look at the rest of this stuff. So the cannon's on the left. Then he said he put cavalry uh, to the, to the uh, left of the cannon to guard the cannon. And then he mentioned this reserve troops, reserve troops. He didn't say how many, but he said he put preferential companies under the command of Lieutenant Colonel Luelmo, Luelmo as a reserve. But he doesn't say where he put them, but he mentioned it right with the cavalry. So when I made my own map, oh, never mind, I'm going to get to that later, but I've got a map of this in a minute, but I put them over closer to the cavalry. But anyway, that's what Santa Ana said. Now, don't get me wrong. I don't trust Santa Ana, but I did, this seemed logical, and especially when I thought of the archaeology we've done out there. So what were the Mexican breastworks? I would have told you six months ago that they had a shoddy breast, breastworks, and it was made out of gear and stuff like that. Santa Ana said that he spent the night directing the guarding of a parapet that would make the position of the cannon advantageous and would cover it. So Santa Ana is saying the parapet is for the cannon. Delgado, Pedro Delgado that I told you about, 
said Santa Ana was arranging a readout for the cannon. Once again, he says the same thing, that the breastwork is for the cannon. He, said, he mentioned mule rigging, sacks of crackers, baggage, etc., that they used to build this parapet, this breastworks with. And uh, he also went on to say that there was a second uh, 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 structure built a weak and useless parapet of branches extending to our front and right. So in, now picture in front of the Matamoros Battalion and to the right is branches. Uh, that's not going to do a whole lot of good. But So we're basically talking about two different breastworks. And the only one that had any uh, wherewithal and probably was pretty worthless anyway was in front of the cannon. Delgado, uh, at the time the battle started, said he had stepped up on the uh, grand entrenchment, he called it, which was made of ammunition boxes. So that's another thing he threw in that might have been in the breastworks. Okay, so what happened when Coase got there? Uh, uh, he arrived, anywhere, depending on which witness, sometime the morning of the 21st, between 9 a.m. and 11 a.m. Santa Ana basically throws a fit about the, the quality of the troops that came with Coase. He describes this as a major factor in why he lost that battle because he said, I ordered chosen troops and all I got was all these recruits. Well, I told you that the guys that came with Coase mainly were the regular infantry companies of those three battalions and two of those three battalions fought at the Alamo. So, you know, there was no choice that Filosola had for better troops. He could have sent maybe the Zapadores Battalion, but it was a very small battalion and they were, they were the sappers, so I, I don't know that that would have been that much better. But it, that just doesn't hold water, Santa Ana's argument that these troops were poor troops. Filosola admitted that there were recruits, there were rookies in there, but he said, but no more than the other units that I had. And he had a lot worse units than these that he sent, that's for sure. He could have sent some that were much poorer. So Santa Ana also said that the Texans thought it was a ruse. I'm sure that a lot of people have heard that. They thought, he says the Texans uh, thought that they were just trying to make them think that there was a reinforcement when there wasn't. But we're aware that that courier, the Mexican courier and, and Bachier uh, were, were captured and there were, we know there were documents, we don't have them, but we know there were documents from Coase and from Filosola to Santa Ana saying he was coming, he's on his way. So they absolutely knew the Texans did that Coase was not, uh, that was, he was coming and that it wasn't a ruse. So that doesn't hold water either. Um, Santa Ana said he allowed the soldiers to rest Coase's reinforcements until that supply wagon got there. He said it would only be two or three hours and they were only going to rest till that time and then he was going to get them in the position. That's what he said. Uh, Delgado reported that Cosa's troops were allowed to remove their weapons down to their leather straps. That would be the cartridge belt box strap and the bayonet strap. Not take those off, but they were allowed to uh, take their weapons off. And he said, sleep lightly in a nearby woods. Now that to me, when he said in a nearby wood, that goes along with the fact that Cosa's troops were not way over on the right, out of touch with the Mexican uh, camp and with Santa Ana. And that's going to be very important in, in another point that I'm going to make about the counterattack. So I think we've got Cosa's troops close to the Mexican camp. This was the map that I came up with on the aerial photograph. 3P uh, up here towards the top right here. That's the three preferential companies. And MB is the Matamoros Battalion right here. That's the Mexican front, okay? Um, the MC is the Mexican cannon, and I put it right where the marker says. I'm beginning to believe more and more that those veterans that went out there years later, they, they knew what they were talking about. They'd been there, and I don't think things had changed that much. Cavalry is next. They are guarding the left of the cannon. And then I put the Mexican camp, I put it over here closer to the Mexican, uh, the far right, because uh, that's where Yoakum put it. And, and uh, it makes sense, especially it, it, I wanted them to be fairly close to those three preferential companies because they talk about this accurate fire that was devastating. 
And then uh, the reserve, once again, I don't know where Luelmo was. The reason I put it over here behind the cavalry was because uh, Santa Ana mentioned it at the same time as the cavalry. So that, I, I think that that's the least accurate of, of, I just didn't know where to put it, but that's why I put it where I did. And then Coast, I wanted it to be close to the Mexican camp, but several of the witnesses I'm going to introduce you said they were the furthest away Coast's troops were. So I wanted to put them in the, in the very rear. Okay, so what happened when the battle started? Santa Ana said he awoke to firing an inexplicable disorder. Um, he said that one party, that's of the Texans, he, he actually gave a number, he said 116 is the number he came up with under Sherman. He didn't know it was Sherman, but he said 116 soldiers, Texans, had routed these three preferential companies on the right and were causing confusion with their accurate fire. A preferential company, if we go back and look, it's going to be anywhere from uh, probably in the neighborhood of about 30 to 50 men. So we're talking about at most about 150 Mexicans over there in the woods. He said there were 116 Texas, but he said that they were overwhelmed and that the Texans were making an accurate fire from that woods. He said the rest of the enemy attacked on the front with their two pieces of artillery and their cavalry on the left, so the Mexican left, which would have been where the Mexican cavalry was. And he said that, uh, he, he, he stated that he reinforced the line of battle formed by the Matamoros Battalion with the Aldama Battalion. Uh, I, once again, I'll get, we'll get back to it, but I find no evidence that that, that, it, that ever happened. In fact, most of the eyewitnesses tell the opposite. He may have ordered them to go, he, yeah, but they, uh, I don't think they did. And then Caro, Ramon Caro, uh, of course, he's very anti-Santa Ana, uh, and that's a different story about why he was. But uh, he said the enemy advanced to within 200 yards of our trenches without being discovered. He's saying that we didn't even see them until they got within 200 yards, okay? Now, Delgado, Pedro Delgado, says that at 4.30 in the afternoon, the bugler on the right signaled that the enemy was advancing on that front. It seems like everybody's in agreement that, the, uh, that Sidney Sherman's troops on the Texans' left hit the Mexican right first. His Excellency and his staff were sleeping. The greater part of the troops were doing the same. Delgado even said that Castrione and some of the officers were having a party at the time. I thought that was interesting. Uh, he said the cavalry had just finished going bareback to water their horses, so they weren't saddled up. He said the enemy attack column, and this is when he stood up on those ammunition boxes, he said their attack column was no more than one rank, very extended, and in the center, the great flag of Texas on the flanks, two light cannons. Well, that makes me think that they had a cannon on each flank, is what he's saying. They had one on the right, one on the left. Once again, I didn't go back and see what the Texans said, but that's what he said. I've seen one uh, person question whether that means they had four cannons, two on each flank, but I think we're pretty sure that wasn't the case. He said their cavalry occupied our front and extended to our left. That doesn't make any sense to me, but he's saying the cavalry actually hit their front. Uh, and I don't think that's probably the case. And he said that with a frightening scream and making a lively fire of canister, he's saying here the Texans are using canister, uh, uh, a musket and rifle they advanced against the camp. Now, for those of you that don't know, canister is basically uh, making a, a cannon into a shotgun. They'd take a, a can of small uh, uh, balls and they would fire them kind of like a shotgun instead of using a solid cannonball. So was there a counterattack? Let's look and see, because this would have taken some organization and I didn't ever believe it, but let's look and see. This is Santa Ana's statement about the counterattack. He said, I instantly organized an attack column under the command of Colonel Manuel Suspedes. Suspedes was the commander of the Guerrero Battalion. And the Guerrero Battalion, like I said, is one of the important units here. He, he says it was composed of the Guerrero Battalion and pickets of the Toluca and Guadalajara. We don't know whether that's the preferential troops. He just says a small number is basically what a picket is from these other two battalions. He said, this column at the same time as the reserve column under the command of Lieutenant Colonel Luelmo 
marched forward to contain the movement of the enemy. So he had two columns he said that he sent out as a counterattack. He said, my efforts were in vain as the line was abandoned by the two battalions that covered it. The two columns were dispersed, Cespedes was wounded, and Luelmo was killed. So this is his story. It didn't make any sense to me because I always thought the Guerrero Battalion was way over on the right and Cespedes it probably would have been with those troops. The, the Guerrero preferential troops were with Santa Ana, but it didn't make any sense to me that the, the Guerrero was way over on the right. How in the world could Santa Ana ever organize a counterattack? Well, now I know this Guerrero Battalion and the reinforcements were not over on the right. They were near the Mexican camp. So now it becomes maybe plausible. This, by the way, is the actual, a copy of the actual document where he's explaining this. I happen to have that in my archives. So about 10 years later, Filosola wrote his, his memorias, and in there he had an actual eyewitness count from Cespedes. He had Cespedes write him his uh, 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 statement, a uh, documentation of what happened that day. Cespedes said these sighted two columns were destroyed by accurate fire of the enemy. He said, left dead on the battlefield were Lieutenant Colonel Peralta, and I found him. He's definitely listed as dead, and he was in the Guerrero Battalion, so it makes sense. All the officers of the Corps and a great part of the troops, so he's saying a lot of the troops were killed, too. He said, the entire force under my command was lost, and I was gravely wounded in the left arm. So Santa Ana said he's wounded. Now, he said, I was gravely wounded in the left arm. He said, he said, I retreated in the direction of our camp, towards the Mexican camp, and this was interesting to me. He said, I noticed that our troops had abandoned the only piece of artillery we had, and only General Castrillon stood his ground. All our troops had abandoned the line. Now, to me, the fact that he says, as he's retreating, that he sees Castrillon there, that tells me he's right there in the neighborhood of the Mexican cannon. And that, that, once again, that's very important that that's where the counterattack took place, is back, back basically where the Mexican cannon was. So Ramon Caro, I looked at his stuff, once again, very Santa, anti Santa Ana. He says he reported that order had been, orders had been issued, and I just threw in this because I had not seen this before, orders had been issued for an attack on the enemy the next morning. I had never heard that before, that they had already issued the orders to attack the Texans the morning of the 22nd. He said, by the time Santa Ana woke up and reached the front, it had already been defeated and completely routed. So he's saying Santa Ana did make the effort to get up to the front, but by the time he got there, everything had fallen apart. So he goes on to say, when then did he organize these two columns? He didn't have any time. He acts like, no, that didn't happen. And he also says that Colonel Cespedes is in Mexico City now, and he can testify to the truth. So he's sitting there thinking Cespedes is going to say, no, that didn't happen. Ten years later, Cespedes said, yeah, that happened. So we got a little gap in the, in the historical record there. And he also went on to admit that Cespedes was wounded, but he said he was wounded in the trench, and he's still suffering from the effects of the wound. Okay? Here's an interesting list. This is a list, once again, out of the Mexican military archives of the Mexican officers who were captured, not the ones that died, but the ones that are captured. And I think this is a really interesting list. I obviously cropped it so I could make it big enough for you all to see. But the first one on there is General Martin, uh, uh, Mar Martin Perfecto de Cos. And in the sideline in the column, it says he is gravely sick with pain in his stomach. So that's his condition. I thought that was interesting. I, I'm guessing that might have been nerves because they thought that he was going to, he was going to be executed uh, because he was the notorious uh, oath breaker. And, and the third guy on the list uh, uh, right here, Manuel Cispedes, okay? And it says uh, sick due to a wound in the arm. So, so he was wounded in the arm. This, this list has him on there. I. I Kept a couple more names for you because down here at the very bottom is Pedro Delgado, Lieutenant Colonel Pedro Delgado. So these characters are showing up in these documents. Then we happen to find Cespedes' military record, and that's kind of nice. Uh, it's, it's very thorough, and it's got his whole career on here. But it says, uh, the part that we're interested, he says on the 18th of April, 1836, he marched with his unit from the Brazos River under the command of Coase. I didn't ever know whether he came with Coase or Santa Ana. Now we know he came with Coase. 
He came to aid and reinforce the vanguard section that was commanded by the commander in chief. He said they joined him on the morning of April 21st, and it says in the disgraceful action of San Jacinto, he commanded the column that attacked the enemy. That's pretty convincing uh, evidence right there. The majority of his officers in the battalion were lost. He had a severe bullet wound in his left arm and was taken prisoner on the same field of battle. Now, unless Cespedes decided to, to jump on this that Santa Ana said he was in charge of the attack column, uh, this is pretty convincing evidence. So what do we know about this possible counterattack? First of all, we know that Cespedes came to San Jacinto with Coase and not with Santa Ana. He commanded the Guerrero Battalion, but he would probably have only been in command then of the regular infantry companies that came with Coase. And the two preferential companies were probably still with Santa Ana's troops. Therefore, Cespedes and Visavi uh, Coase and the rest of the reinforcements were apparently camped near to the Mexican camp in order for Santa Ana to be able to try to organize this counterattack. So once again, I think we have more evidence that Coase was not on the right. He was somewhere very close to the Mexican camp. Caro denied the counterattack counter took place and said Cespedes was wounded and while at the breastworks. But Coase, you got to remember, Caro was very biased in this. So when in doubt about the gaps in the historical record, my uh, idea is to look at the archaeology, OK? The archaeology sometimes is a lot harder to explain away than the historical record. You can talk about Caro's bias when he wrote what he wrote. But the archaeology, you got to pretty much explain why this artifact is where we found it, OK? And it's all about location, location, location. That's why I always try to get my metal detecting friends to please don't go out and just metal detect places and take the artifacts and sell them on eBay because it's all about where they were found that gives you the information. This belt plate that the guy in the middle here is showing is the, what, that Guerrero belt plate that we found. And if you look in the background, you can see the monument. But if you look closely, you can see the pavement. And that's that cul-de-sac out to where Sam Houston was supposedly wounded. So we're right out there in front of the Mexican cannon, but we're on the other side of the, of the breastworks. So I would argue that the archaeology supports the counterattack. The two Guerrero chest plates were found, it was, and one was in the vicinity of the cannon. The other one was very near to where Sam Houston was reportedly wounded. This means the first is likely near where the Mexican breastworks were, and the second one was well in front of the breastworks. These two plates are solid evidence, but not proof, because we don't know exactly where the breastworks were, that there was a counterattack and that the Guerrero Battalion was definitely involved. We didn't find any other breastplates, by the way, just the Guerrero plates. This also supports the idea that Coase was not far to the right of the Mexican camp, but his reinforcements were likely close by. Now I want to introduce a couple of other witnesses here, and it gets, makes things a little bit cloudier again. I've got four enlisted men that happened to get on a steamboat, and they got back to Mexico pretty much before anybody else did. And of course, the, 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 the Mexican government and the army was very anxious to depose these guys. And there's very long depositions from each one of them. I'm guessing most of you have never heard of these four gentlemen, but they have some wonderful material. And I'm, I, unfortunately, I had to cut it down so much because I had so much information. I'm just giving you a few bits and pieces here. But we've got four guys. They were all in the units that, that, that we know were there. And it gives their, their positions and everything. I'm not aware that the two Reyeses are, are related, but they are in the same unit. So it's possible, but they don't mention that. So what do they say about Coase? And what, where do they say uh, the troops were? I also wanted to, to document what they said about which troops fled first. That was one of the questions that was specifically asked of them which troops were let, uh, fled first. This first guy, Juan Reyes, says he said the attack, when the attack began, Santa Ana was berating the Guerrero and the Adama battalions as they had already abandoned the field and retreated to the rear guard. Thus, they were not able to advance on the enemy. So that doesn't look very good for our counterattack. This guy's saying the Guerrero and the Adama, they were gone before anything happened. Uh, Toribio Reyes, said that Coase arrived with the Aldama and the Guerrero. He doesn't mention the other troops that were with him. He said they placed themselves at the rear guard of the column and stacked their arms. He said the troops were the close, that were close to the line 
began their fire, the ones that were far away, the Guerrero and the Aldama fled first. So now we got two guys that are saying that Guerrero and Aldama were in the back. Now this one is really interesting. Uh, Santa Cruz, he, he said he glanced towards the rear guard where the Aldama was placed. He did not see any soldiers as the entire unit had fled into the woods. On the left, the Guerrero was firing and making a resistance in part and the rest retreated into the same woods. And I thought this was really interesting. It was like a light went off to me. This guy's saying part of the Guerrero fought. Part of them fought, okay? Uh, Sanchez doesn't help us much. He just says it was interesting to me that he said they were erecting tents. He doesn't say where they were erecting tents. He states that the units were the furthest away, the, where they were Guerrero and the Aldama and the Primero Mexico, and they ran away first. And the only ones that held their ground and were fighting were the Matamoros and the Toluca. Now, the Toluca was part of the counterattack, supposedly. So uh, he may have seen some of them fighting. So we got only one of the four really supports the possibility that there was a counterattack. The, the last one, maybe you can get a little bit of a, of a leeway there, a uh, hint there that maybe there was. Let's go back to that uh, uh, slide that gives the percent. And to me, this is very telling. The Matamoros, everybody seems to agree that they were at the front and they were fighting hard, and sure enough, they had bad casualties. The Guadalajara, to me, the fact that they had 86% casualties would reinforce the idea that there was a counterattack because they had a huge number of casualties. And then if you look at the Aldama, all these guys said the Aldama was the farthest away. Santa Ana said that he sent them to the front to reinforce the Matamoros, but uh, looking at these numbers, they didn't go. They were already gone or they took off, okay? So I think the Aldama was definitely not the Guerrero. The Guerrero gets all the fame for being the first ones that fled, but I think the Aldama obviously was the ones that fled. And the Guerrero's in between. And when you look at the fact that it's in between, that is very suspicious to me that part of the Guerrero battalion took part in that, in that attack, but not all of them. And that would go along with the, the witness. So was there a counterattack? Um, two of the soldiers placed them at the rear, the Guerrero at the rear, uh, and one said they fled into the woods immediately, but one said that part of the Guerrero stayed and fought. The fourth witness said that only the Matamoros and the Toluca stood and fought, but part of the Toluca was also reported to have been in Suspedes column. So the Toluca, the Guadalajara, and the Guerrero. The troops from the Guerrero that fought in the column of Suspedes could have been the preferential companies that came with Santa Ana, but if you look at the percent captured and killed, I, and I think that probably Cespedes was with the regular troops, that I think that's probably not the case. I think their regular infantry was, was the column. And if the Mexican breastworks were where the marker shows them to be, it is likely, due to the location of those Guerrero plates, that some type of counterattack was, uh, uh, took place. And by the way, this is the flag of the Guerrero Battalion that was captured, and it's at the, uh, at the State Museum. I want to give you some tidbits from these depositions, because there was so much good information. I couldn't just tell you just about the counterattack. I wanted to give you some tidbits. I think that this will perk the interest of multiple uh, people here. Uh, one of the witnesses said when the prisoner Santa Ana arrived in the Texans camp, they played Diana's, that would be reveille or drum rolls, a celebration. He said with two drums and a small whistle, the only instrument the enemies had. So here we have the two drums and the small whistle at the local hotel on the day of the battle. <laughs> one of them said that of the 500 prisoners, uh, 1100 were, or 111 were wounded, so about 20% were wounded of the prisoners. Um, this was fascinating to me. One of the guys said the enemy carried two flags, banderas is the word he used. He said one with the America painted white with a blue stripe. And he didn't say with America, he said the America. And I tried to look up and find out what part of a flag is called the America. That made no sense to me. But the, the ladies from the uh, San Jacinto Museum, when I was talking to them before the, the conference here, they were telling me maybe he was talking about that the, the Lady Liberty or the Lady was the America, and she had the blue, uh, uh, yeah, the blue stripe, the, what's that called? Sash, that's a good word. 
So maybe that's what he was talking about, describing. The other one is interesting because he said the other was all blue with a big star in the middle and many little ones that were all white. I couldn't find anyone with little stars, but I found this flag, which is, I think, the De Zavala flag, and supposedly was never manufactured, but I can see from a distance those letters looking like stars, like little white stars. So that's as close as I could get there, but he talked about him having two flags, and he described them both. Uh, one of the witnesses said that a short time after the fighting started on the, on the right, the enemy started shooting on the left, and he said they came out of a pasture, a grassy area. So that, once again, makes me feel like they, they, the, the high uh, pasture, the, the prairie, definitely helped hide them as they were advancing. Um, another uh, witness said that on the 20th, the first interaction between the armies, the enemy fired a round of canister, once again canister, fired by the enemy. And I do think the Texans had canister. Archaeologically, we have found two can uh, uh, iron pieces that were ends of canister, were not the type the Mexicans would have fired, and they were more in a position where we think the twin sisters were. So we've actually found uh, iron ends of canister rounds where we believe the twin sisters were. So that goes along with the fact that the Texans were firing canister. He said, he said His Excellency ordered to open fired with a solid ball uh, from a four pounder. So he's calling the Mexican cannon a four pounder, which is, uh, we're pretty sure that's not the case. But interesting that he talked about a solid ball. That's the only mention I've ever heard of either side firing a solid cannonball. So if you see on eBay uh, uh, some solid cannonball for sale that was found right near uh, San Jacinto, it, it probably is not a San Jacinto cannonball. Could be, but it's probably not. I would take it with a little grain of salt. Um, so tit, uh, uh, some other tidbits. Upon Cosa's arrival, he commanded his troop to erect tents. Pabayonas was the word he used and advise them not to leave. That's the only mention I've heard of troops in raising tents. I've never heard of any of the enlisted men having tents, so I assume that they are raising the officers' tents. But once again, I don't know that. So I, huh? Two minutes. Two minutes, okay, I'll hurry up. President retired to his chosa. That was a hut. That was probably his campaign tent. Um, the, all the witnesses ended up going to New Orleans, and they were helped by Mejia and Farias, and they said that they formed up on the morning of the 22nd. Uh, the, the Texans did to bury two officers, and the Mexican camp was right there. Now I want to get real quickly into the deposition of the priest of, of Augustine de la Garza Montemayor. This was Santa Ana's private priest, and he gave a deposition when he got back. And I want to point out to you that the, that the guy that took the deposition, the officer, you look at the very first line, Jose Enrique de la Pena, is the officer that was in charge of this deposition. He stated that, that uh, some of the prisoners went to Galveston and they were working on fortifications. Others were shipped out to do domestic works. He said the treatment was appalling. And he said they were only given a few handfuls of, handfuls of corn. And they were treated, the wounded were treated in a manner offensive to humanity. And as a priest, I guess he gets to, 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 to decide. He said they, they had about 700 men, and they were armed, but they weren't familiar with the art of war. And he said now they have 2,000, but only half of them are armed. I love this statement. That some, this guy had, a, to me, a real good feel for what was going on on the Texan side. He said they're divided because the volunteers come from the north and destroy the property of colonists. The volunteers don't want to be commanded by the colonists, the result of which there's a constant turnover of commanders. The scarcity of supplies keeps the volunteers in a state of uproar with a constant threat that if their contracts are not fulfilled, they're going to leave. And he said more than 200 have left, and he said more left later. He also mentions that at Galveston, where he was a prisoner, that they had two four-pounder pieces with which they attacked. The enemy attacked us on the 21st as well as a six-pounder that fell into their control on that day, the only one that the Mexican troops had. So he said the Texans' cannons were four-pounders. He also told him that the Mexican consul in New Orleans had ordered some, some, told him that the Texans had ordered cannons from Havana, but they wouldn't pay for them and they were sent back to New Orleans. And he, he thought the enemy had sufficient munitions because they waste them in military exercises and hunting 
Also, they have the custom of discharging them into the air to reload them upon, upon being relieved of guard duty. I remember a story about when they got to San Jacinto very first, they all shot their guns because I think the gunpowder could be wet. He said the same day he left New Orleans for Mexico, the Invincible left for New York, and the Brutus remained there at New York. Those were Texas schooners. Takeaways, the Mexican position at San Jacinto were likely much different than have been previously documented. There probably was a counterattack, but it amounted to very little, I think. There's a huge, and I can't emphasize huge enough, of un amount of untouched archival materials that await us. I barely touched the surface. And we obviously need more archaeology. And I would reiterate, we need more archaeology. And if I didn't say it uh, enough, we need more archaeology at San Jacinto. Thank you. Thank you, Greg. That was fascinating. Um, Professor Steve Harden needs a new introduction. <laughs> Thank you, Jim, for that warm and generous introduction. <laughs> the late uh, Sir John Keegan observed, many armies beginning as crowds, remain crowd-like through their existence. He probably was not thinking of the Texian army of 1836 when he typed those words. Nevertheless, they go far to explain its conduct. The quotation appeared in his classic 1976 magnum opus, The Face of Battle. In it, Keegan focused less on the commanders and more on the rank and file at the sharp end. Not a bird's eye view, but the experience of combat from the worm's eye. Many historians have examined the Battle of San Jacinto, but none have done so through a Keegan-esque lens. Employing techniques pioneered by Sir John, I will attempt to examine the Texas soldier's experience. His Grace, the Duke of Wellington, expressed disdain for insolent chroniclers who attempted to expound upon a battle at which they were not even present. The history of a battle, he insisted, is not unlike the history of a ball. Some individuals may recollect all the little events of which the great result of the battle is won or lost, but no individual can recollect the order in which or the exact moment at which they occurred, which makes all the difference as to their value or importance. And the accounts of San Jacinto prove his point. Few combatants could even agree when the battle commenced. M. H. Denman avowed that the Texian advance began about 3 o'clock in the evening. Samuel G. Hardaway remembered that it commenced in the afternoon about 3 or 4 o'clock. Yet in a letter penned only two days after the encounter, W.C. Swearingen swore that the rebels launched their attack at half past 12 o'clock. Of course, in 1836, uh, no one can synchronize his watch to any sort of accepted standard. Consequently, any mention of a specific time is at best an estimate. All that is certain is that historians cannot know the exact time the battle began. Still, the consensus is that the engagement opened sometime between 3 and 4.40 p.m. Generals seldom viewed every part of a battlefield, and the typical dog face saw even less. Many of the participants' accounts are highly vivid, but one should remain mindful that the individual soldier had an extremely limited angle of vision. The battlefield itself contributed to the myopia. In, term, in fact, the term battlefield is something of a misnomer 
if one accepts the definition of a field as an open area of land without trees or buildings. Traditionally, commanders sought open spaces to better maneuver large formations of soldiers. Yet such terrain was unavailable at San Jacinto. Hardwood forest bordered bayous, rivers, creeks, and gullies. Tall coastal grasses, at times growing as tall as a man, obscured the killing ground. As we advanced, Joseph Lawrence of uh, Henry Carnes Company, remember, the Mexicans did not see us until we were within a hundred yards of them. As it happened, the topography favored the Texians and their rifles more than the Mexicans and their muskets. It was also a black powder action. After continuous firing, the dense cloud of smoke obscured the area. 19th century observers called it the fog of battle. A soldier could barely see the man in line next to him, much less the enemy downfield. In a very short time, perhaps a minute, the firing became general. Lieutenant John Pettit Borden of Mosley Baker's company reported, smoke from the cannon and small arms rendered it almost impossible to see the shape or size of our enemy. But on we pushed pell-mell, helter-skelter. This is one reason rebels, or Texas rebels were so eager to close with the enemy. It was difficult to kill those one could not see. Finally, historians should recollect that battles are occasions of acute emotional trauma. It is doubtful that any Texan soldier registered much more than the horror that was swamping him and his buddies. He would have been more focused on self-preservation than keeping a faithful record for posterity. Veterans never recalled the entire ebb and flow of a battle. What lingered in memory were random bits and snatches, notable for their distinctiveness. Many of the veterans recounted that during the battle, their fatigue bordered on exhaustion. In the days leading up to the battle, each rebel infantryman had marched under the weight of weapon and pack. Marching at a normal pace, a man could march about 15 miles a day. Yet during the march toward Harrisburg, the army covered some 60 miles in two days an impressive feat for seasoned regulars, much less volunteer militia. That these men were willing to maintain such a breakneck pace demonstrated their eagerness to encounter the Mexicans. As one of Houston's aides de camp, Alexander Horton affirmed, there was no time to be lost as the enemy was at the door. The pace levied an aching toll by the, name, by the time of the main battle on April 21st, most had not fully recovered. Once in combat, however, many Texians seemed to have experienced an adrenaline rush. In a letter to his father written soon after the battle, John W. Hassel of Robert J. Calder's Rosoria Company described his feelings. I had a first-rate rifle, and about this time I was using her, sir, with all my might. She run about 40 to the pound and shot first-rate. I took notice of some of the big yellow bellies, and when Betsy would bore a hole in them, the claret would gush out large as a cornstalk. One big fella, I remember who I shot in the neck, and it appeared as though his head, it cut his head off. I shot Oh, Betsy, six times and a large holster pistol one time. In the seven shots, I know I killed four. That thing I know. As I have stated about my pistol, I shot that fellow in the left eye. And though it may appear strange to you, 
but not less stranger than is true. It seemed to do me more good at that time to throw a shot or a bayonet run through them than anything I have ever yet seen, and it appeared to be the prevailing feeling or sentiment. Well, sir, I must tell you, when we got so near them as to shake hands, they couldn't bear that. They appeared rather bashful at such meetings that, and turned their backs on us, and uh, the, the rest of the way off was about that time we were slaying them like corn stalks. Well, one can only hope uh, Hassel was feeling the effects of adrenaline. If not, he was one of history's nastiest sociopaths. Once the uh, adrenaline subsided, most soldiers experienced ex acute weariness. The Mexican cavalry broke in disorder, James Washington Winters recalled, while ours was hotly pursuing them. One of the avenging horsemen was Joseph Lawrence, who recalled the chase. For the first six miles, they ran very even and kept out of reach. But after that, we gained on them and shot our carbines at them, dropping them off their horses. We then used our holster pistols and long knives. There was not one of our 80 men that did not get one or more of the Mexicans. He then described the sensation when the killing ended and the adrenaline wore off. At the end of 12 miles, we all stopped to rest and let our horses rest. When we dismounted, we were so fatigued that we could not stand up and fell around like a company of drunken men. Thirst for gore. The savagery with which Texian soldiers assaulted the Mexican camp and their refusal to accept the surrender of enemy soldados, many of whom were crying, me no Alamo, me no Goliath, have become an accepted part of the battle's lore. John Hassel was not the only man on the field who relished the killing. Robert Hancock Hunter, a private in uh, William W. Hill's company, recounted the instructions of one captain when General Houston gave orders to take prisoners. Boys, he told them, you know how to take prisoners. Take them with the butt of your guns. And remember the Alamo. Remember Laba here. And club, gun, right and left and knock their brains out. Colonel John Austin Wharton rode among the banks of Peggy Lake where Texians were shooting hapless Mexicans floundering in the murky waters. Sergeant William Swearingen of Captain Amasa Turner's company described the scene. It was nothing but a slaughter. They at first attempted to swim the bayou but were surrounded by our men and they shot everyone that attempted to swim the bayou as soon as he took to the water. And then that remained, they killed as fast as they could load and shoot them. William Foster Young related much the same story. We drove them into a marsh and I sat there on my horse and shot them till my ammunition gave out. Then I turned the butt end of my musket and started knocking them in the head. Witnessing the carnage, Wharton ordered his men to cease fire. Yet James Dixon, a private in Captain Richard Roman's company, rejoined, Colonel Wharton, if Jesus Christ were to come down from heaven and order me to quit shooting yellow bellies, I wouldn't do it, sir. I've always liked that, sir. With that, Dixon cocked his rifle, daring Wharton to enforce his orders. Sergeant Moses Austin Bryan of Captain Mosley Baker's company, who observed this test of wills, later chronicled, Wharton very discreetly, I always thought, 
turned his horse and left. Many prominent veterans of the battle described Texian atrocities that shocked and distressed them. Brian recounted the wanton killing of a Mexican drummer boy. Dr. Nicholas Labadee, assigned to the medical staff, described the murder of Colonel Jose Batras. In a killing frenzy, some of Henry Millard's regulars mistook the, wound, mistook the wounded Alfonso Still for a Mexican and almost killed him. The butchery he witnessed that day haunted George Bernhard Erath, and even uh, years later he admitted, I do not like to dwell on these scenes. Well, neither do most Texas historians. Most concede that Texians shielded uh, to a butchering frenzy, but failed to assess their psychology. Few soldiers ever fought with a greater sense of grievance. In an April 10th letter to his parents, Giles Albert Giddings of Captain William Woods Company A explained his provocation. The enemy's course has been the most bloody that has ever been recorded on the page of history. Our garrison at San Antonio was taken and massacred. Another detachment of 700 commanded by Colonel Fannin and posted at La Bahia after surrendering, surrendering prisoners of war were led out and shot down like beasts. That would have been enough to induce the ire of Texian settlers. But during Santana's advance through the Anglo settlements, they had witnessed their homes burned, their crops laid waste, and their loved ones left refugees. Private Giddings continued, in their course, the Mexicans showed no quarter to age, sex, or condition. All are massacred without mercy. If such conduct is not sufficient to arouse the patriotic feelings of the Sons of Liberty, I know not what will. Many of the company commanders fanned the flames of this malevolence. Mosley Baker's pre-battle speech made such a lasting impression on Private John Menifee that he later reconstructed it from memory. Remember, you are fighting an enemy who gives no quarter and regards neither age nor sex. Recollect that your homes are destroyed. Imagine your wives and daughters trudging in mud and water, and your children crying for bread, and then remember that the author of all this woe is within a short distance of us, that the arch fiend is now within our grasp, and all, uh, and the time has come, at last, for us to avenge the blood of our fallen heroes and to teach the haughty dictator that Texans cannot be conquered, and that they can and will be free. Then, nerve yourselves for the battle, knowing that our cause is just, and that we are in the hands of an all-wise creator. And as you strike the murderous blows, let your watchwords be, remember Goliad, remember the Alamo. Standing in ranks behind Barker's unit was Captain Robert James Calder's company. The plain-spoken officer knew that he could never match Baker's oratorical eloquence, and so he simply told his men to avail themselves of Captain Baker's sentiment and make the effort double. <laughs> there was another reason at play fear. The soldiers knew how exhausted, discouraged, and low on supplies they really were. Near the end of their tether, they were unsure how much longer they could sustain the war effort. They needed to complete the job today because they might be unable to tomorrow. 
Captain Jesse Billingsley explained the thoughts of many. Having but scanty clothing, and many of us without shoes, and our property gone, we were naturally eager for the fight, knowing that nothing but victory could save us. And the chance of that was diminishing every day, and feeling that we must soon give out. And to crown the whole, our confidence in General Houston's intention of coming to an engagement was becoming weaker every day. Texian troops gained the momentum early in the battle and were afraid of losing it. Once Santana's division had become, as Mexican officer Pedro Delgado described it, a bewildered and panic-stricken herd, the rebels sensed that the battle was going their way. But they were also aware that the impetus could shift in a heartbeat. If routed soldados could rally long enough to form a battle line, they might deliver a devastating series of volleys which could turn the tide. The rebels realized they were fighting at numerical disadvantage. William S. Taylor affirmed the disparity of numbers was much on his mind as his unit rode after the retreating Mexican cavalry. As there were but some 15 or 18 of us, and some 60 of the Mexicans we were pursuing, he allowed, we saw that it was impossible for us to take prisoners. He hastened to add, however, we had but little disposition to do so, knowing they had slaughtered so many of Fannin's men in cold blood. As they swept through the enemy camp, Texian troops were unwilling to halt for anybody or anything. According to Major Robert Coleman, near the end of the battle, General Houston ordered a ceasefire, asserting, glory enough has been gained this day, and blood enough has been shed. Yet Dr. Lobbity recounted that Secretary of War Thomas Jefferson Rusk rode among the troops, shouting at the top of his voice, if we stop, we are cut to pieces. Don't stop. Go ahead. Give them hell. And so they did. It took time to take prisoners, time the attackers did not allow defenders lest they employ it to reassemble. Moreover, soldiers must tend to prisoners. Dead enemies require no supervision. Had Texians taken to the rear every Mexican who attempted to surrender, the rebel army would have evaporated. Civilians learn that it is disgraceful to kick a man while he's down. Yet war is not sport. In a life and death struggle, the best time to press an enemy is when he is overwhelmed and demoralized. David, the Hebrew shepherd boy, did not pause after he fell Goliath, the Philistine, with a smooth river rock. He rushed forward and decapitated him with his own sword. He aimed to make sure that that enormous bastard did not get back up. Unsporting, possibly. Effectual, completely. Indeed, most of history's tactical masterpieces illustrate this principle. It sounds atrocious when one says it out loud, but Texian soldiers at San Jacinto were wise to maintain the pressure. But to do that, they could not stop their buckskin blitzkrieg to take prisoners. Killing helpless soldados was, therefore, practical, prudent, and proper conduct under those particular circumstances. 
Referencing Waterloo accounts, John Keegan observed the following. What sticks in the forefront of survivors' mem memories is combat itself, their own and their comrades' behaviors, the actions of the enemy and the effects of the weapons they faced. Is it possible from the reams of testimony they have left to discern in these dozens of transient individual experiences any pattern of human activity, any concrete reality of battle in this, the apogee of black powder warfare? Even to begin to do so requires that we separate out the various categories of man versus man and man versus weapon encounters which went to make up the totality, totality of the conflict. In terms of its strategy and tactics, the Texas Revolution continued Napoleonic systems. One is therefore wholly justified to employ Sir John's methodology to make sense of the battle and the men who fought it. Of all the branches in the Mexican army, Texians feared the cavalry the most, and for good reason. In the skirmish of April 20th, Mexican regular cavalry had mauled Sidney Sherman's unit of Texian horse and forced them off the field. In that action, Mexican horsemen came dangerously close to killing or capturing the Republic's Secretary of War, Thomas J. Rusk, and would have done had it not been for the quick action and steady valor of Private Mirabeau B. Lamar. On April 21st, General Houston placed his mounted force on the far right of his line. He worried about the enemy's lancers. Had they been able to strike the Texian right flank, they would have rolled up the line like a sleeping bag. Consequently, Houston deploy, uh, deployed his cavalry, uh, now under the command of Lamar, who had jumped to the rank of colonel overnight, as a blocking force. Yet it tortures any definition of the word to describe Lamar's unit as cavalry. Napoleon uh, carefully categorized his mounted forces according to task-specific roles. During the Texas Revolution, however, neither side employed such equestrian variety. Santana had at his disposal only regular, medium regular cavalry in the form of dragoons and lancers. Irregular rancheros, however, performed yeoman service as light horsemen. For his part, Houston possessed no regular cavalry at all. One might best describe the Texian horse as mounted riflemen. Fortunately for them, the Mexican regular cavalry, the same force that had proved so formidable during the skirmish the day before, failed to offer any offensive movements on April 21st. What accounts for the feebleness of the Mexican cavalry that day? Two factors. Having stood on alert all day and throughout the previous night, around four o'clock Santana had his men stand down. The Mexican mounts were as exhausted as their riders who removed saddles and bridles for a well-deserved respite. Having seen to the needs of their horses, the cavalrymen collapsed into their bedrolls. The Texians launched their attack with such surprise and suddenness that the Mexican cavalrymen did not have sufficient time to saddle their horses and form up in battle order. By the time they did, the rebel line had disintegrated and the enemy was pouring through camp. In a second, we were into them with guns, pistols, and bowie knives, recalled Private Walter P. Lane 
In a short time, they were running like turkeys, whipped and discomfited. Those Mexican cavalrymen that the rebels did not kill on the spot mounted up and fled. Vengeful Texans did not allow them the time to form up and countercharge. No doubt Lamar was heartened to observe Mexican cavalrymen skedaddling. Even so, he had to ensure that they did not regroup and returned to wreak the kind of havoc they had the day before. So he ordered his mounted riflemen to pursue them. As James Washington Winters, Joseph Lawrence, and M.H. Denham recounted, they continued the pursuit for several miles and with considerable mayhem. Consequently, on April 21st, the impact of the dreaded Mexican cavalry was nugatory. Artillery also played a negligible role in the April 21st battle. Only three pieces graced the field. The twin sisters, short-barreled six-pounders employed by the Texians, and El Volcan, El Volcan, the Volcan, Volcano, uh, employed by the Mexicans. Many veterans, including Sam Houston, claimed it was a 12-pounder, but Mexican field reports prove it was only a six-pounder. Some rebels referred to the cannon as the golden standard. That name, however, appears on no Mexican documents. Triumphant Texians probably dropped up the title, and it stuck. Both commanding generals and the gunners themselves would have preferred to deploy their artillery more than they did. Yet in both cases, the behavior of the Texian infantry thwarted them. Ben McCullough, one of the gunners manning the twin sisters, left a brief but revelatory explanation. We commenced firing at 210 paces from the enemy's breastworks and kept in advance of our line until, until we were less than 100 paces from the enemy when they gave way and were pursued by us 250 paces beyond the breastworks. But we were prevented firing from our own men who had outstripped us in the race. Texian gunners appear to have directed their fire against battlefield obstacles. As Alfred Kelso of Captain William Hurd's company reported, our cannoning soon knocked their breastworks to pieces and we were ordered to charge. The twin sisters only fired a few times. It was not more because, as McCullough confirmed, the charging taxi and infantrymen obscured their field of fire. No longer able to operate their cannon, the gunners abandoned them, joined the charge, and fought the rest of the day as infantry. It is impossible to determine how many casualties the twin sisters inflicted, but since they fired so few times, and then against breastworks and not enemy soldiers, the number was likely negligible. Likewise, the dash of rebel infantry denied El Volcan a more momentous part in the battle. Mexican gunners could not have deployed it too many times before the Texians rushed on like tigers, overwhelmed their position, and captured their ordnance. It is impossible to determine how many of the 11 Texians killed and the 30 wounded fell to El Volcan. Yet the gun almost certainly claimed one fatality. Riding 40 yards in front of its bore, General Houston's gray stallion, Saracen, fell lifeless, quote, having been pierced with five balls. For all five rounds to have landed at once, they must have been fired 
from a canister round fired by El Volcan. Texian infantrymen, infantrymen were San Jacinto's greatest killers, inflicting, inflicting the greatest majority of Mexican casualties. Students of the battle have acknowledged the savage lethality of the rebel foot, but most failed to consider the reasons. The Texians achieved tactical surprise, but most studies exaggerate the degree to which they caught the Mexicans unaware. Numerous accounts mentioned the heavy fire encountered during the rebel advance. In a letter to his relatives, Moses Lapham recalled the intensity of the enemy's musketry. The enemy opened their fire at a distance of 300 or 400 yards, but our men marched on the 100 yards farther when our officers ordered them to fire. But most of them, especially the Texans, know better the range of their rifles and the military character of their enemy, and rushed eagerly ahead, wholly regardless of the shameful order of our general and officers, until within 100 yards of the enemy, when they gave a destructive fire, and some of the officers had sense enough to charge, which would have been given, order or no order, and they rushed on like tigers, mounted their breastworks. The left wing, uh, commanded by Colonel Sherman, were the first attacked, uh, were first attacked by a heavy fire of musketry from the timber, Captain Robert Stevenson reported. The center and right wing, commanded by Colonel Burleson and General Houston, marched forward until a discharge of grape and canister from the enemy's uh, artillery in front, which were at last, we were obliged, obliged to charge. Likewise, Private Joseph Lawrence confirmed that the Mexicans fired a terrific volley of small shot at us, but fortunately they shot over our heads. It seemed at one time that if one had held his hat two feet above his head, it would have caught 20 bullets or more. Lawrence was not the only veteran who recalled the heavy but ineffective enemy fusillades. Alfred Kelso also recounted that the Mexicans overshot us with their muskets. General Houston envisioned a more formal battle one in which ranks would fire, reload, and continue. Yet had the Texians proceeded in such a manner, they probably would have lost the battle. During the time required to halt and reload, the Mexicans could have formed behind their barricades and returned concentrated musket fire. As the Texian line dissolved into clusters of shock troops, the soldados had no main body against which they could direct their fire. Ellis Benson of Amasa Turner's company told how the general hallooed at the top of his voice to, uh, to the men to halt, but they would not listen, and on they swept upon the enemy. By that stage, Houston's orders were as irrelevant and unheeded as his soldiers were defiant and foul-smelling. Company commanders were unwilling to stand in ranks and wait for the enemy's marksmanship to improve. Kelso meant no words when he wrote, we were ordered to charge, but it is clear that those were not Sam Houston's orders. Once the Texians broke their line and pushed forward toward the barricade, they gained momentum and never lost it. 
as M.H. Denim, Denim described it, their whole line gave way and a scene of slaughter took place which defied descriptions. And Mexican accounts tell the same story. Meeting no resistance, Colonel Delgado lamented, the Texians dashed lightning-like upon the deserted camp. Lightning-like, I love that phrase. Texian volunteers fought as individuals and within the limits of their personal comfort zones. Some riflemen, like John W. Hassel, viewed the battle as a hunt. They marked their man, aimed, brought him down, later being able to recall specific details of each kill. To assist rapid firing, James Monroe Hill testified, the men in his unit carried the rifle balls in our mouths. Others, frustrated by the rifle's slow rate of fire, employed them as bludgeons. Our men either threw away their guns, recalled Goliad Massacre escapee Charles B. Shane, or used them as clubs. More than a month following the battle, one visitor reported finding as many as 200 broken rifles littering the ground. Weapons that had been broken, he explained, beating out the brains of the Mexicans. But many veterans mentioned the use of knives. As an anonymous correspondent reported, an anonymous correspondent reported the valiant behavior of Captain Juan Seguin's company in a dispatch published in the Richmond Inquirer. One Tejano, he reported, with a bowie knife killed 25 of his countrymen. Most modern day academics view such claims with skepticism. I do not. Recall that frontiersmen had more occasion to use blades. They routinely field dressed game and slaughtered livestock. For men habituated to blood and viscera, slitting a man's throat would have been no more taxing than that of a hog's. Indeed, if victims were unarmed and offering little or no resistance, it would have been easier. In bare knuckle combat, the Texians enjoyed a distinct advantage. The average Anglo-American of the period was taller and heavier than the average Mexican. The typical soldado was less than medium stature, typically standing about five feet five inches in height. Yet, Mexican Army service papers reveal desperate officials accepted recruits as short as five feet. The rebels were aware of this disparity and were eager to take advantage of it. Indeed, Texan veteran Noah Smithwick openly mocked Mexican troops with their shriveled little bodies. Not only were the Mexican troops, as a rule, slighter than their enemies, they were also malnourished. Mexican logistics had long since broken down. Santana allowed each of his soldados only eight ounces of hardtack or corn cake per day, not nearly enough to sustain a man on campaign. Various Texian veterans complained of being hungry before and during the battle, but Mexican soldiers were actually starving. Each veteran's personality determined his battle experience. 
Some remembered the day with exhilaration, others with pride. Recollecting atrocities committed or witnessed, a handful looked back with horror and shame. The typical San Jacinto veteran was a product of an American militia tradition and saw himself as a citizen soldier, not a professional. He had no patience for any regular army claptrap. He was no dupe of the state. He did not fight for procedures, policies, or pay. His incentives stood over the hearth, roasting game he had bagged, napped in the crib he had created, grew on land he had cleared and planted. Because his imperatives were so personal, he gleefully slaughtered all who threatened them. And he fought as an individual, defending his own interest, perceiving killing as a job that needed to be done, he pitched in and did it. Then he packed up and went home. Thank you very much.